Hi, I'm back. I'm going to remove this because I don't think the internet connection is going to be good enough for this. So can you see the first slide now? Yes, now I can see and, it and I can hear you perfectly. Yeah. And I can yeah. see it changing. You can see it changing. Okay, good. Yeah, okay. All right, then, fine. Well, ready when you are. Okay, then let's get started with your talk. Uh, Dr. Efren, uh, Paquio Xavier, mm -hmm. Open Source and Mining, a roadmap. All right. Uh, thank you very much for having me, uh, Joshi. So uh, this talk uh, is the open source GIS and mining a roadmap, and that's going to be basically uh, core for GIS open source GIS developers to actually look uh, around the corner and uh, think a little bit more of what they could do for the mining industry and uh, all the untapped, the, the sizable untapped. Uh, market that uh, there is for them. So my name is Evren uh, Pekushai. I hold a PhD in geology from University of Western Australia uh, that I obtained in uh, 2018. And for the past five, six years, I've worked in the METS industry, that is the mining, um, mining equipment technology uh, suppliers uh, industry, they're serving the mining industry with technology, which includes uh, software and uh, uh, equipment, uh, just such thing as dump trucks all the way to, uh, to drills. And uh, during my times as a consultant and working for a software development uh, company, developing proprietary 3D geological uh, modeling software, I noticed that uh, at conferences, and, uh, and business meeting, there were never any open source alternative that were presented, uh, especially when it came to, to GIS. And that at the end of the day, um, everything could be on, on principle be done with uh, open source technology, uh, database with Poges and uh, uh, actual client with, uh, uh, with QGIS. And that this needed to be remedied. One year ago, I joined Auslandia where I am uh, leading <clears throat> the expansion of Auslandia into the METS sector. And this is a call to actually say, well, this doesn't have to be our own uh, uh, private uh, uh, backyard. It can be, actually, there's enough space for, for, for plenty and lots of the technologies that are being developed by uh, in the open source uh, GIS community are actually applicable uh, to mining, but there's been some kind of uh, a lack of communication uh, between the two, which is mostly due to uh, a lack of awareness. So to actually um, <clears throat> move on, I'm going to start with a, a, a basic concept, the concept of, of demand. Sometimes I uh, hear people, especially in a, in a let's say, in open source uh, uh, communities, that mining is kind of something that is about to uh, to disappear, to to go away. Uh, that we don't want it anymore. So I would like to. Make it very clear here, we're not talking about oil and gas industry and uh, and coal. We're not talking about fossil fuels. We're talking about the mining industry. So we're mostly talking about uh, uh, metals here. And uh, to prove my point, uh, to take the, uh, the point home, to bring the point home, here is a table of elements uh, with <clears throat> some elements highlighted in green and in red, some in both. And what this table actually tells you is which elements are considered critical uh, by academics, which are basically um, economic geologists and the uh, European Commission. That's fairly recent, 2018, 2020. And you can see that some, you've probably heard of uh, things like uh, rare earth elements. They are at the bottom here being uh, critical elements that we have trouble uh, sourcing in uh, for electronics. But elements that people don't usually hear about, like uh, nickel, copper, zinc, cadmium, uh, are actually uh, under high tension and uh, they are uh, very well needed for the future, especially to transition into renewable energies and for uh, uh, electric motors, for example, for copper. And when it comes to cadmium, nickel, zinc, this is also for, uh, for uh, batteries. Another concept uh, that is often uh, misunderstood is that if uh, you are uh, either at the conference in, in Buenos Aires or you are uh, at home, uh, you might look around and have a misunderstanding of what is rare and what is not around you. And just to give you a quick example, I think most people, if you just 
uh, sit down for a minute. I'll just ask a quick question, which is rarest between copper and titanium in the Earth's crust? Uh, I'd say that 90% of, or maybe more, of people will tell you that titanium is surely uh, much rarer to, to, to much more difficult to obtain than copper. Whereas actually, uh, copper is about 30 times uh, less abundant in the Earth's crust and then titanium. Uh, this essentially means that copper is actually a rare resource and that we need a lot, lot, lot of it. And there is a lot of investment uh, going in there. So to drive the point a bit further, staying on copper, this is uh, basically <clears throat> data followed by a projection. 2020 is about uh, midway through this graph of the total demand versus supply uh, for copper teragrams uh, on uh, on the y-axis uh, basically are million million tons so the primary supply being the mining supply what comes out of mines and the secondary supply being essentially recycling and that's why it only starts appearing in 2010 and it's a very ambitious and very optimistic secondary supply projection starting from 2020 that is having exponential growth here and the total demand also having exponential growth mainly driven by the shift to renewables the shift to uh, electric uh, uh, electric cars and also electric uh, heating systems and uh, population uh, uh, increasing and global life standards uh, improving and the primary supply is set to start diminishing uh, let's say for real around 2050 now this is a bit too pessimistic on this uh, on this end because as uh, copper will become rarer and more difficult to source the price will go up technologies will improve and we'll mine out things uh, we'll mine out deposits that we usually uh, that currently we know about but we don't consider economical to mine out so this is just a bit of context to just show that mining is really there to stay and is actually very very much needed to uh, to be able to actually face the challenges of uh, global warming, uh, global warming, sorry, uh, for uh, uh, for the future, especially to power so this shift to uh, cleaner uh, technologies. Now, of course, with that comes uh, the notion of investment, as if we were, as if I am encouraging GIS open source developers to. Uh, go and get involved in the mining industry. I have to talk a little bit more of how much is being invested in uh, the mining industry. So this is just a 2017 figure, which is a very poor figure. Actually, it was a very poor year. Uh, investment figures in millions of US, millions of dollars, US uh, in the world, <clears throat> with the two major players, Canada and Australia. And this was only for mineral exploration, not for investment, such as we are building a mine from scratch. So here you've got about $8 billion dollars us invested in the year 2017 just for exploration and that was a bad year uh, for mining there's a mining boom currently going on and there'd be a lot more uh, there's a lot more being invested in the 30 billion dollars just in being invested in uh, in exploration uh, alone that is we don't know if there is any deposit we have some idea with favorability mapping and and, and the likes which by the way uh, relies a lot on gis uh, technology and we uh, uh, we are just uh, basically trying to f find something. So this is like high risk investment. Uh, but when it comes to actually investing in a mine, a single mine could absorb that much investment. A single mine could cost $10 billion uh, to build and to, to set up. And this is also the scale, the magnitude of these uh, uh, enterprises is often uh, uh, not understood uh, by the general, uh, the general public. So basically, basically, this is just a small a tiny graph that I asked our graphics designer to make. I really like it very much. And anyway, this is just to tell you that the mining uh, uh, mining cycle goes from exploration to development to early production for production reclamation. Reclamation is when we restore the environment um, <clears throat> to uh, not exactly its previous condition. That's not really possible, but to something that is going to impact the environment less. So here, the investment I was talking about was in the exploration stage, but when it comes to dev its development and early production, where the most is uh, uh, being uh, invested uh, and then full production where actually there is a return on uh, on investment. Now, the next thing we're going to do, we're actually going to look at a, at a more interesting map. We're going to think of location. And now that I've installed uh, uh, the environment, uh, I, I set up the scenes and we have a bit of context on why mining matters and why we should care. Uh, location 
uh, is uh, of the mine is critical to its economical value. And if you look at this map, and you, uh, you, this is just, of course, a map of Australia, these are all mining sites for metals, base metals, strategic metals, rare metals, everything. And uh, this is, of course, from a uh, source from Geoscience Australia, the Geological Survey of Australia. This is current. This is 20, well, 2020, but it's basically current. And <clears throat> what this, this shows uh, is uh, that I'm, I'm not showing the geology here. And you might tell you, you might think to yourself, well, of course, these uh, mines must be related to geology. And that is completely correct. The right conditions have to be met for uh, deposit uh, uh, to, be, uh, to be found. But most importantly, if you look at this map, you realize that uh, the likelihood of finding a mine is strongly correlated to distance to the shore. And that is because a mine is an economical entity and exists only if it's worth uh, mining something at that location. In other words, if a mine is too far off for any existing infrastructure, uh, it might be difficult to make a case for its profitability. And this is the reason why there's mine all over the coast it's because they need to be close enough uh, to uh, uh, to harbors to actually ship the ore out as uh, Canada is producing a lot, lot more uh, than it needs for its own supply. It's only 20 million inhabitants, uh, but it produces pretty much all the iron for everybody, for the whole of, uh, of humanity and ships it uh, to China. To uh, make it more obvious, this is a map of Western, Aust of Western Australia from sourced by from the GSWI. And what we can see here is that most mines are located along roads. So even the mines that are actually inland happen to be located along main uh, main uh, roads. And the reason why we're talking about this is to uh, basically make everybody understand here that a mine is essentially about logistics, the logistics of extraction, the logistics of the processing, the logistics of the shipping. This is what is going to cost you money. And no matter how big a deposit is or how high the grade is if the logistics don't line up the accounting doesn't line up and there is no mine because there is uh, no point uh, sending anybody there uh, at a loss so basically a mine is not only these things like uh, <clears throat> you know on-site uh, monitor monitoring drilling on the right and on the left these are crushers uh, which are basically going to take the ore that is, uh, has been blasted uh, off the face in big chunks and then reduce it into smaller chunks to actually be uh, processed further. And it's not only uh, large dump trucks taking, uh, you know, these large slabs of rocks and uh, taking them out to the processing uh, plant. And uh, this is the image that uh, many people have of these mines. It's uh, so basically, and you end up with this tiny uh, this this cute little uh, diagram of what a mine is. By the way, mines are a lot, lot more complicated than that, but we'll see that uh, in a minute. So these things indeed exist, and that's pretty much how it looks like. At least this is like the uh, toy a example. Uh, it's mostly about infrastructure and networks, and here we are entering GIS territory. It's about infrastructure management, network management, deploying, uh, deploying infrastructure, designing it, and then running the networks, monitoring them, maintaining them, and uh, of course, uh, uh, using them. So about networks, there's going to be lots of different types of networks. For example, as I was talking about the connection to the shore, there's going to be railway networks. So there's going to be, and this is all privately owned, privately operated, privately designed, and privately deployed. This essentially means that the miners, the mining companies, have their own systems for handling railway traffic for handling road traffic, for handling internet. They have their own, going to have their own cable networks for electricity and internet, telecommunications. They're going to have their own water network. On the right here is actually a camp. In the middle uh, of the bush in Western Australia, uh, in the outback, you're going to have to build a city from scratch. And this is why this investment can be, and this is a city only for the people working at the mine. Um, it's going to have, it's all the amenities. It's going to have electricity, and it's going to have gas, going to have the internet, it's going to have a water, uh, a water piping for, of course, uh, uh, you know, sewage and uh, drinkable water, industrial water. All of these, all of the networks, the infrastructures and the infrastructure network that you can think of for a city or a region exists at the scale of a mine and have to be completely set up from scratch as soon as the mine is a bit too far out uh, uh, away from 
uh, uh, state uh, uh, infrastructure, nationwide uh, infrastructure, and can even go to such a point where it has it, uh, a mine has its own power station, and this is actually on the Brockman Syncline, uh, so that's an iron ore mine owned by Rio Tinto, has its own power station. It generates its own uh, electricity. They, have, they, have, they might have their own dam. They might build a dam to generate hydroelectricity, or they might have uh, a, a, a gas-powered station, or they might have a solar power station, as there's been a shift uh, to that to be less reliant on external uh, on external supplies and of course is going to have their own ways of managing it like a small city like a small country uh, uh, almost at, at that point point. and to give you an idea of the scale this is the brockman syncline 4 this is an iron ore mine owned by rio tinto in western austria north north uh, eastern western uh, australia uh, it's really far from everything and the scale uh the in the top uh, left corner is 1,500 meters, not very visible, but this white bar here is 1,500 meters. So this is site number four, which is uh, easily 10 kilometers. There's an airport, it's not an airstrip, it's a paved runway, and there's a camp over here. This is about 15 kilometers in size, and this is one out of eight similar sites. There's eight other sites and uh, other camps. There's only one airport, however, and this is to give you uh, that are all around. Uh, if you just if you just zoomed out a bit out of this of the satellite imagery, you'd see a lot more. So these are massive, uh, uh, massive city scale infrastructure that are privately managed and privately owned, and there is a lot to do. And it can even go down to things like ventilation networks for underground uh, uh, mines or telecommunications networks underground. Uh, uh, also, they're going to have their own mobile network, uh, actually their own GSM network that they're going to be running. Uh, so what about uh, the contribution that uh, Auslandia has been uh, making to, uh, uh, to, uh, to this? What is uh, possible for uh, uh, GI open source GIS to uh, get involved in? Well, what we've done is that I've mostly been talking about early production and full production here for uh, my example. And but what we've been uh, involved in is, uh, in, well, exploration and, and, and production uh, with the mining industry with Orano and, and Senfire, uh, uh, Senfire resources being the uh, two uh, uh, pioneering uh, uh, clients. And there is a lot of interest in the mining industry uh, to open source uh, for open source GIS technology and to actually have a little bit of uh, competition with, uh, uh, let's say, uh, legacy solutions that have been around for a long time and that are showing signs of age and that are uh, basically crying for uh, being disturbed a bit, uh, uh, being disrupted uh, a little bit. Uh, in any case, what we've uh, done in uh, this uh, scope of Adaslandia is uh, Albion, for Orano, which is 3D geological uh, modeling for uh, the purpose of exploration. So this is to find Rolfron style uranium uh, uranium deposit it has cut down the exploration time from uh, at least the, the data processing that was tied to the to the to the acquisition of the exploration data from about four months to six weeks compared to the products that they uh, used to use, the, the other solution they, they were relying on, which was, of course, not QGIS, not uh, uh, an open source Q, uh, QGIS plugin, uh, but was a proprietary uh, uh, a plugin running on a proprietary uh, GIS uh, 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 soft, software that uh, starts with an A. Um, with that said, we also worked on, oops, that's not open scope, that's QGeologies. This is a strat log. Uh, a strat log uh, viewer, which lets geologists have uh, uh, visualize all the data that they collect when they are uh, when they're doing drilling. So this is useful for uh, at all stages, really, except a reclamation where there is drilling going on every day on a mine. There's uh, usually at the end of the life of a mine. There's pro there's dozens of thousands of holes that have been drilled for monitoring, for exploration, for development. Uh, and uh, this is a tool that lets uh, users uh, actually visualize uh, this data by selecting uh, by selecting a hole on the on the on the G on the GIS uh, package. Just 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 select one of these points, and then there is, they can visualize 
the lithological data, geochemical data, geophysical data, uh, and of course uh, the technical data that is actually tied to the drilling, uh, the drilling itself. And what we are actually uh, uh, working on at uh, the moment, uh, these are projects that have been uh, have come to completion, is uh, Open Log, which is going a step further. That is trying to instead of developing specific plugins for one to meet to, to meet the needs of one specific clients, uh, we've gone out and we've asked consultants, uh, we've asked miners, we've asked geological surveys uh, what they wanted most out of QGIS to help them with uh, mining activities. And their answer was drill hole visualization in 3D, 2D, and uh, of course on the map. So partially reproducing, uh, replicating, sorry, the, um, I'm sorry, the functionalities of QGeologists, that is basically being able to visualize strat logs, uh, sorry, strip logs, uh, but also being able to draw sections on a map and project drill holes onto uh, these sections, which is basically a Cartesian projection, uh, being able to visualize these drill holes uh, in 3D and be able to visualize uh, lithologies, basically which type of rocks are at what depth, at depth, color coded in 3D so that they can have better spatial awareness working on the field, all with the flexibility of having where basically unlimited licenses, basically unlimited installs, being able to run it on a tablet with QField, uh, being able to run it on their workstations and uh, and uh, deploy it uh, deploy it at will. So this is what we are currently raising funds uh, for, and we have uh, managed to uh, get about a dozen uh, miners on board. Uh, my sorry, a dozen uh, partners, including uh, seven uh, Australian mining companies uh, on board. And uh, we hope to make this uh, uh, a project to make both the open source GIS community and the mining industry aware of, of QGIS and aware of uh, open source technology, that QGIS is uh, a mature product and that uh, they have actual choice uh, in the, the matter. And uh, that'd be it for me. Excuse me, Dr. Abraham. We need to finish up early. I'm done. Ah, you just finished. Yeah. Oh, okay. Perfect. Then thank you for uh, thank you very much for the talk. It was very interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, now we have some time for questions and answers. Uh, please leave your questions in the question tab. And now it seems like we don't have any. Oh, there is one. How do you consider similar applications for surf for surf surface and environmental investigations? Contamination in soil, ground weather, etc. Absolutely. As a matter of fact, a rem soil remediation and simulating, for example, uh, the diffusion of pollutants in an aquifer is something that mine uh, mining industry does and that, there, that the mining industry is relying on proprietary product at the moment is completely ignoring, not because they choose to, but just because of a lack of awareness, because nobody's reaching out to them. And they do use these things. So everything that you can think of that you're developing probably has an application in mining, because as I say, when you set up a mine, you're setting up a it's like setting up a whole country's infrastructure from scratch. So you're going to have needs for hydrogeological simulations and you for the reclamation step you will need to think of uh, of how you're going to 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 handle uh, to handle that because the days of just at least let's say in democratic countries where populations actually have a choice uh, the days of just dumping everything back uh, in back into the open pit without thinking too much or just leaving everything as it is that's not how it's done anymore and that now mines are being designed with a reclamation in mind. And of course, these technologies are important, uh, uh, are go have uh, find applications in, in the mining industry. Very interesting. Okay. I think we don't have any more time for any more questions. So thank you very much for your presentation, Dr. Efren. 
Well, that, thank um, you very much. Thank you for having me. And uh, uh, hopefully this will, you know, motivate and uh, inspire uh, uh, people to actually uh, uh, look around and say hi, uh, hi to the miners. Everything that we own, everything that we have around us comes one way or another from the mining industry. And uh, it's better to, you know, give them a hand and let them be more efficient if we want uh, to actually, uh, you know, uh, expand more. And I think this is a great avenue for open source GIS to uh, uh, grow even uh, even more as it deserves. Yes, absolutely. I think this is a great idea of well, like just man. Okay, then we will be seeing you around the for g and thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye-bye.